Welcome to lecture 14 of the course on high performance computing. You'll remember that in lecture 13, we looked in some detail at what happens behind the scenes in a paged virtual memory system. Recall that this is the part of the operating system responsibility which takes care of the sharing of main memory among many programs which might be on ex in execution on a computer system at a time. So the summary slide which pictorially showed you what's happening behind the scenes is, uh, we'll go back to that slide right now. So in this slide, what, what, what we had seen was a situation where there are four processes, P1, th or, I'm sorry, a number of processes, P1 through Pn, all actually in some state of execution in that all are in memory in some form or the other. At this particular point in time, since um, obviously all the pages all the virtual pages of all the processes cannot be in, in main memory, which in this example was quite small. Main memory in the small example can hold only four pages and the sum total of the pages of all these processes is many times that. So what page virtual memory does is it remembers all the page virtual pages of all the processes which should be in memory on hard disk, which has a very large capacity. And at any given point in time, some of those pages would be present in the main memory. And the mapping between the pages that are present in main memory and the virtual addresses that they correspond to is maintained in the page tables of the processes, as this example showed. So we were looking in more detail at one particular problematic situation that could arise, and that is the situation where a pro particular process, say P1, is running and makes a reference to a particular memory page that is not currently present in main memory. For example, if process P1 was to refer to its page 3, if you look at the page table entry for process P1, you notice that page, virtual page 3 is not present in main memory. Among all the virtual pages of process P0, only its virtual page 0 is present in main memory. In fact, at main memory, physical page 0. This particular situation is what is known as a page fault. And it is detected when the attempt to translate the address is made. So the page table entry would then be referred to. It would be noticed that there is no meaningful mapping and hence the page fault would be identified. And uh, in order to do this, it's useful to have a particular bit in the page table entry called the valid bit, which would have a value of 1 for those pages which have a meaningful mapping. In other words, the PPN entry for that page is, is the correct translation information and a value of 0 for which the page table entry does not contain meaningful information and therefore the copy of the page on disk is the meaningful piece of information regarding that particular page. So we have uh, included a valid bit which is more frequently referred, uh, abbreviated as the V bit and I, I, the notation which I am using is to put a question mark to indicate that it is a bit in any of these uh, table notations. Okay, so the page fault is a situation that must be handled and uh, we, we understood that the handling is done by a part of the operating system which we would call the page fault handler and what the page fault handler would have to do is to find or make space in main memory for the particular page, in this case page 1 of, uh, of process P1, to be copied from the disk into main memory. So the first step is to identify place in main memory to be used for this purpose, subsequently copy the page from, it, from disk to main memory and subsequently update the page table entry. So these are the tasks of the page fault handler and the problematic situation which could arise in this case is that there may be no free slot in the main memory to be used at this point in time. And uh, if that is the case, then the page fault handler would have to actually re replace one of the pages which is currently in use in order to make space for this newly requested page to be copied from disk to the memory. And this is the task of the page fault handler known as page replacement and the task may involve evicting a page from main memory. So we were looking at, uh, we were about to look into what kinds of criteria could be used by the operating system page fault handler in deciding which particular page to eliminate from main memory in the event of a page fault. And this particular decision making part of the page fault handler would be an implementation of what is called a page replacement policy. A policy is a, you can think of a policy as being a strategy or an, in, in this particular case, an algorithm that is used in order to make the page replacement decision. Right, so we are going to address this question. 
How does the page fault handler decide which main memory page to replace when there is a page fault and there are no free main memory pages? In other words, the free list of free, me free memory pages is empty. Okay, now before we actually look at possible policies and uh, get, a, get a feel for what the, uh, the operating system where our program is running might be doing behind the scenes, it might be useful to understand how important this decision is. The way that we'll understand how important this decision is by thinking of what the worst case policy might do. In other words, if the operating system did the worst job possible, what would it do? One way to think about this is, in the worst case, the operating system's page replacement policy could be so bad that it, repla it always replaces a page that is going to be the next page accessed by the processor. Right? So uh, the, uh, the, this would, of course, be a little difficult to implement precisely because in order to implement this particular policy, one would have to know the operating system page fault handler would have to know what's going to happen in the future. But this is hypothetically the worst way that things could go. Now, why do I consider this to be the worst possible scenario? A scenario where every time a page is replaced from memory, it just happens to be the page that would have been needed next. Now, if you think about this a little bit, you'll realize that if every time a page has to be removed from main memory, that page which is going to be needed next is the one that is replaced, that would mean that in the near future when that particular page that was replaced is requested by the processor, that would generate another page fault. And every one of these page faults, as we know, involves copying a page from the hard disk to main memory. So in order to get an idea of how important the page replacement decision is, we have to know a little bit more about how much of a penalty it is to copy a page from hard disk to the main memory. So let's uh, uh, just step aside a little bit and try to get a feel for how slow or how fast the hard disks are. Now when we were talking about uh, processors and main memory, we were concerned about the speed disparity between the processor and the main memory. And I had given you a, an idea about approximately how big the speed disparity is today by suggesting that the time, fr the time scale on which the processor operates is a nanosecond time scale, whereas the current uh, main memories operate on a time scale of about 100 nanoseconds. In other words, one event of interest may take about 100 nanoseconds which is what I would describe by the speed disparity of about two orders of magnitude. One nanosecond compared to 100 or 10 to the power of two nanoseconds. And that was a, a major concern to us, that there was a two order of magnitude speed disparity. So what is the situation? Uh, and I'll remind you that nanosecond is 10, power, 10 to the power minus 9. Nano stands for 10 to the power minus 9. So what's the situation as far as hard disks is concerned? Let me tell you a little bit about hard disks. I'll be telling you a lot more about hard disks later when we talk a little bit about <coughs> the input and output management task of the operating system. But uh, from what we've seen already, you'll recall that on the current magnetic hard disks, such as those used in personal computers, laptops, many laptops, as well as a lot of servers, the remembering of instructions or data is done by the current state of certain magnetic material. So these are magnetic storage devices. And uh, one thing which is important to, no to know here is that the disk is a mechanical device in the sense that uh, the mechanical material is on a surface and that surface is actually rotated in order to access the different parts or the different pieces of data stored on the hard disk. And this is done by motors. The rotation of this, uh, this plate or disk is done using motors. And the, motor, the, the plate itself has a coating of magnetic material. So in some sense, one should, could view the disk as being a mechanical device. Unlike many of the other components of the computer system that we have talked about, we talked about processor, we talked about main memory, which were purely electrical or electronic devices. They contained circuits. In some cases, the, the circuits the circuits could have been of quite different kinds as we can see from the fact that the speed disparity between processors and memory are uh, fairly large. But in any event, they were all circuits. Here we have something quite different. This is actually what I would call a mechanical device. And uh, again, as on a smaller side, let me just mention that uh, many of you would have noticed that your computer, your laptop or your desktop does make a lot of noise. and. Uh, Noise is not something that we typically associate, the, the kind of noise that you get from your laptop or desktop 
It's not something that you would normally associate with electronic circuits. Because electronic, in electronic circuits, uh, there, there's some flow of current, some charge accumulation, things of that kind. And things happen at a very high speed, and uh, there's no particular reason to think that noise might be generated. Whereas we know that our computers are quite noisy. And these noises are generated by some of the mechanical devices inside the computer. One of those mechanical devices which generates a good part of the noise uh, that your computer is guilty of are the disks. There are dis there's a disk to rotate the, the, the magnetic coated uh, surface. There are, other, there, there are other motors for other purposes within the disk drive. Now, some of the other noises that you hear from your computer, since we're just on a smaller side talking about the noises, are actually due to fans. Fans, once again, are mechanical devices. And they too have motors. But uh, you may have wondered why are there fans inside your computer? And th the answer to that question comes from the el electronic electrical circuits in the computer. Now, when the electrical circuits are operating, they consume energy. They from so you know that the, the electric uh, el el electric bill at your at home is probably higher than it used to be years ago before you had a computer. And this is largely because the computer does consume electricity. And a good percentage of the electricity is consumed by the electronics, by the processor. And if the processor is doing things, it needs energy to do things. But as a, as a, as a result, as you know, even if current passes through a wire, heat is generated. In other words, some of the energy is dissipated in the form of heat. So as this heat, uh, for a high-speed processor, the amount of heat generated could be substantial. And therefore, there's a need for cooling, hence the fans, and therefore the noise. So at the moment, we're not too concerned about power. In this course, we won't talk about the problems of heat. But uh, very clearly, there are mechanical devices inside the computer. And currently, we're worrying about one of them, the disk. Right, so the disk is a mechanical device, which means that its rotation is going to be done by a motor. And hence, the speed of the disk is, to some extent, going to depend on how fast the motor is rotating the disk. And you, were, you may have heard about disks which rotate at 7,200 revolutions per minute or RPM, faster disks, which rotate at 10,000 RPM. And the faster the disk, conceivably, the faster the rate at which data can be transferred from the disk to the memory. But how fast is that, uh, the, how fast is the disk access, if one assumes, it makes reasonable assumptions about what one might see in a current uh, laptop or desktop? Now, the answer is that uh, a reading a page from a hard disk would take not nanoseconds, but on the order of milliseconds. And a millisecond is 10 to the power of minus 3. And in fact, the amount of time to read a page from the disk could be substantially larger than milliseconds. It could even run into seconds, a second or more, depending on the current state of the disk. And again, I will go into more about disks later. So when we talk about reading a page from the disk, at the very best, we're talking about milliseconds. We could be talking about seconds compared to the 100 nanoseconds that we were concerned about with memory. So disk accesses are, let us say, four orders of magnitude. I'll, just, I'll, I'll use that as a ballpark figure for the moment. If I assume that uh, disk access takes a millisecond and that uh, main memory is on the scale of 10 to the power of 2 nanoseconds, and you do the, you do the calculation here, you'll find that the disks are, at least, are several orders of magnitude slower than main memory. Main memory itself is two orders of magnitude slower than the processor. So going back to the question which raised this aside about disk access speed, the question of how important is deci this decision, the decision of which page to replace from memory in the event of a page fault, we realize that this is a very important decision. Because with a bad decision, many more page faults will be generated. And the more page faults there are, the more disk accesses have to take place. And each disk access is four, maybe more orders of four, at least four orders of magnitude slower than a main memory access. So this is a very important decision. So the bottom line that we learn from this, page replacement policies are important. They have a very big impact on the execution time of our programs. We do need to know something about how the page replacement part of the operating system works, in case that will give us some insight into how we should modify the way that we write our programs. But it, sta it stands to reason from this big, big speed disparity between main memory and disk that the OS page fault handler must be written in some intelligent way. And one strategy which is often used is to have some kind of a model or some kind of an understanding about how programs behave with respect to memory. So if the person writing the page fault handler has some way of reasoning about how programs behave, then he can use that knowledge, he or she can use that knowledge 
to decide how to write the page fault handler. In other words, how to decide which page could be replaced from memory in the, if the need arises during the handling of a page fault. So what we need now is some knowledge about what are considered to be realistic models of how programs behave with respect to memory. A model is some kind of an abstract understanding of a physical phenomenon, in fact, abstract description of a physical phenomenon. Now today one of the most widely respected, most widely believed models for how programs behave with respect to memory access is something known as the principle of locality of reference. It is referred to, it is a principle, um, it is not called a law, a law is something which holds now, always held, will always hold anywhere. This is just a principle which means uh, something which we believe holds a lot of the time to some extent. It is technically what uh, the word principle is in, in used for here. The word reference here is referring to a memory access or a memory reference. Right? So instead of reference you could think that the word memory accesses. So here a principle is being stated, a principle, some kind of a generalization about how programs behave in terms of their memory access behavior. And the key word here is something called locality. And I will state the a principle of locality of reference for us to just get a feel for what. Uh, so basically this is some kind of a commonly believed or commonly observed program property. And uh, this is a statement. Now the statement says, let us suppose that a particular memory address which we will call A is referenced at some particular time T. Think of T as being now. So as the program is executing at some point in time, let us call it time T, the program accesses memory address A. Now what the principle of locality of reference tells us is that it is likely that that particular address as well as its neighboring memory locations will be referenced in the near future. Right? So this particular uh, principle is giving us some kind of a hint or, or it is viewed as some kind of a model about what is going to happen in the near future as far as a typical program is concerned. And this is what we would have liked to have. You will recall that in describing the worst case policy, we were, because of our uncertainty about what was going to happen in the near future, we could have used a, a policy which did the worst possible thing. So with a, a principle like this, we get some kind of a hint about what is conceivably going to happen in the near future and that could be used to prevent the page replacement policy from making bad decisions. So uh, again, read this slowly. The principle is suggesting that if you want to get some feel for what which pages or which memory locations are going to be accessed or referenced in the near future, look at what is happening now. And if a particular address is being accessed now, then it is quite likely that that particular address as well as its neighboring memory locations. So what could neighboring memory locations be? Now you will recall that when we, whenever we talked about memory, memory was an address space starting with address 0 and going up to some maximum possible address. So if I was talking about a particular address A, that is basically some unsigned integer, some number. A could be the ad memory address um, hex 1000 for example. It is a, it's a number. What do I mean by its neighboring memory locations? Quite clearly looking at the picture of memory, I must be referring to the memory addresses which are close to A. In other words, A minus 1 as well as A plus 1 as well as A minus 2 as well as A plus 2 and so on. The addresses around including and around A would, con would constitute the neighborhood of A. Okay, now there are two aspects of the statement that have to be understood. One is the suggestion that if memory address A is re being referenced now, that it is likely that it, in other words memory address A itself will be referenced again in the near future. There is a second aspect of this statement which is that if memory address A is referenced now, then it is likely that its neighbors, in other words A minus 1, A plus 1, A minus 2, A plus 2, etc., are going to be referenced again, are going to be referenced in the near future. So there are these two aspects to this uh, statement of the principle. And in reading the literature related to memory, you may come across two terms which are used. One is to talk about the first part of the principle, in other words the idea that A itself is likely to be a reference in the near future as a statement of temporal locality of reference. Temporal is a word relating to time. And another term which is used is to talk about 
the likelihood that the neighbors of A, in other words A minus 1, A minus 2, A plus 1, A plus 2, etc., will be referenced in the near future from time t is referred to as the spatial the sp principle of spatial locality of reference which is referring to space and uh, you, you can quite clearly understand where the two terms are coming from. So people may separately talk about how their programs show good temporal locality of reference or their programs show good spatial locality of reference and this gives us an idea of what they mean. Now before going ahead and looking at page replacement policies, we do need to get some confidence in this principle that the, in, in the, the, le the legit I mean th that this principle is legitimate, that the programs that we write are likely to show the, the properties which are described here. So once let's do that. Let's ask the question based on our experience, why do we expect that the programs that we write will display locality of reference? Now the picture that we have of the programs that we write, let me just remind you, is that when I write a program, I write it in C and subsequently that program is compiled into something which in, in the machine language which deals with memory references. The program that I write does not directly deal with memory references. I, I could actually write a program in C without knowledge that there is a memory at all. Right? Some of you may have started this course without a clear understanding of why a computer system had main memory. So clearly it is possible to write C programs without any knowledge of main memory. Now we have a better understanding of main memory. We understood that in the Unix Linux world, if I looked at exactly how main memory is used, the, this is the virtual address space of a process going from some address 0, the, the address 0 up to some address 2 power n minus 1. And I know that some of the address space is used for the instructions of my program, some of the address space is used for the statically allocated variables of my program, some of the address space is used for the heap allocated variables of my program, the heap might grow and some of the address space is used for the stack allocated variables of my program, the local variables of functions, the parameters of functions and so on. So what we need to try to understand is as far as the, remember the text relates to the instructions of my program. So the memory references that my programs make, that my program makes could be instruction references and the memory references could be data references. When your program executes, it accesses memory both to fetch instructions as well as to fetch data or to store data. Therefore, in, talk, in trying to assess to what extent our programs show good locality of reference, we have to look both at the behavior of our programs vis-a-vis -vis instructions and the behavior of our programs vis-a-vis -vis data, which is what we'll do next. We'll try to come up with uh, examples of things which our programs commonly do and try to assess whether they're going to be good or bad from the perspective of locality of reference. So in doing this I'm going to look, uh, we're going to look separately at instructions and data because uh, they may have different properties as far as locality are concerned for the typical program and we look spe separately at the same address type of locality which I call temporal locality and the neighbor locality which I call spatial locality. Remember the temporal locality was the fact that it is highly likely that A itself will be referenced again in the near future. And spatial locality was the likelihood that a minus 1, a plus 1, a minus 2, a plus 2, etc. In other words, the neighbors of the address a, which is the current reference, would be accessed in the near future. So we're going to come up with a table in which we're going to try to list things which happen in the programs that we write that are likely to produce good instruction temporal locality of reference or good instruction spatial locality of reference and so on. And if this table is satisfying, then we can say that we believe the principle of locality of reference as far as the programs that we write are concerned. So this is going to be a useful exercise. This will also give us some insight into what kinds of things we could do in writing our programs in order to enhance their locality of reference. So let's think about instructions first. Why would it be, why would, why would it happen that, uh, inst that instruction accesses could show good temporal locality of reference? In other words, why would it ever be the case that if a particular instruction i is currently being fetched from memory, it is likely that the same instruction i will have to be fetched sometime in the near future? That is essentially what the question of temporal locality would address. So if instruction i is being executed now, apparently it is likely that instruction i might be executed in the near future. Now what kind of program features might cause this to happen? You think about this a little bit and clearly we are talking here about either some repetitive behavior, in which case a small loop would cause instructions to show 
good temporal locality of reference. If I have a program in which there is instruction i and instruction i plus 1 and instruction i plus 2, possibly also instruction i minus 1, all forming a loop. In other words, at after executing instruction i plus 2, it loops back to i minus 1, possibly after checking some condition. Now, if I do have such a small loop, let's suppose that at time t instruction i is executed, then possibly shortly after that instruction i plus 1, shortly after that instruction i plus 2, shortly after that instruction i minus 1 and after that in the very near future instruction i being executed. So programs which have small loops, if the loops have a high iteration count, then they would show excellent temporal locality of reference. Now what are the kinds of behavior of, uh, what, what, can, what are the kinds of programs might show good temporal locality of reference? The, the key here is that there is some kind of repetitive behavior and one way to have repetitive behavior is to have a loop. Another way to have repetitive behavior is actually to have a piece of code which is frequently called. In other words, if I have a small function or a function which is called very often, then if I looked at one of the, I have a function and I consider one of the instructions in that function. If the instruction, if the function is small, then every call to the function may just involve executing a small number of instructions. If soon after that the function is called again, then the instruction i is going to be executed again. So frequently executed small functions once again are going to show very, very good temporal locality of reference. So if these are features of your programs, the programs that you normally write, small loops, functions, then you know that your program is going to show good temporal locality of reference as far as instructions are concerned. Okay, and you could in fact enhance the temporal locality of your program as far as instructions are concerned by using these features a little bit more. You could also try to think about, remember when I, when I talk about a sm small loop, I, I could, I'm talking about while loops, if loops, repeat loops, everything comes under that. You could also think about to what extent other features of your program enhance the temporal locality of reference given the definition of temporal locality. But let's move on. Let's next try to think about why it would be why, or to, to what extent the programs that we write show spatial locality of reference as far as instructions are concerned. In other words, if instruction i is in, uh, at address a, I ref I'm referring to it as instruction i, until now I was referring to it as the thing at address a. But let's suppose that instruction i is the instruction currently being executed. The question of spatial locality is that what, uh, why is it likely that instruction i plus 1, instruction i plus 2, instruction i minus 1, instruction i minus 2, would be referenced again in the near future. And uh, we've seen from our discussion of temporal locality why instruction i minus 1 and i plus 1 might be referenced again in the near future as far as loops are concerned. So an immediate uh, answer in the next square which we're going to fill up, the square about why instructions might show a good spatial locality of reference is going to be relating to, well, is going to be relating to loops, right, as we have just seen. But a more frequently occurring scenario is the ordinary code that we write where there is no control transfer, which is sequential code. After instruction i, if I have a piece of sequential code, in other words, I forget about this loop, I just have code which is executing sequentially, then after instruction i is executed, instruction i plus 1 is executed, and after that instruction i plus 2 is executed. In other words, the instructions in the neighborhood of i going forward in memory are, are executed. So sequential code shows good spatial locality of reference. We've seen that loops cause instruction i itself to be executed again in the near future, if the, particularly if the loops are small. But loops in general are going to cause good behavior as far as spatial locality of reference is concerned too. Because after instruction i plus 2 has been executed, instruction i minus 1 is going to be executed in this example if we have a loop. So loops enhance the spatial and temporal locality of your program. So if your programs contain uh, functions, loops, sequential code, then you know that your program is going to go show good properties as far as the locality of reference is concerned with respect to instructions. Okay? And again, a little bit of thought about this tells you that if you write your programs under principles of, under the principles that were taught to you in a course on programming, such as modular programming or object-oriented programming, then these things happen automatically. In other words, the, the, the idea of modular programming or object-oriented programming by definition enhances the temporal and spatial locality of reference of your programs. And you don't, possibly you don't have to worry about it specifically as far as instructions are concerned. Good programming practices will result in good locality properties for instructions. 
But does the same hold for data? Let's fill the table a little bit more to get some understanding of why, what kinds of features of data accesses would cause our programs to show good temporal and spatial locality of reference. Now, let's think first about temporal locality. So the issue here is, I have a variable x, and I'm currently in a situation, x is the variable at address a. So I'm currently in a situation where my program has just accessed address a. Now if the program shows good temporal locality of reference, suggestion is that in the near future it will reference that variable again. So we need to ask ourselves what kind of scenarios and programs would cause this to happen. A variable which is currently accessed is accessed again in the near future. And you can think of situations where this happens. For example, if I have a function, we had the example of our function b from our function call scenario where there were two local variables. I think they were called x and y. They may have been called a and b, but there were two local variables. Now, why did I declare those as local variables? I declared them as local variables because I wanted those two pieces of data to be used while the function was executing. Therefore, it is very likely that those two variables will be accessed within the body of the function. So if one of them is accessed at time a, or at, at time t, references to memory location a, then it's very likely that sometime in the near future it will be accessed again because it is a local variable of a function. There are a small number of local variables of the function. They were included there specifically. They are likely to be accessed again and again within the function. Therefore, local variables are likely to show this property. Another kind of a variable that you use which may well show temporal locality of reference, if you think about it a bit, is a loop index. What do I mean by loop index? Consider a for loop. In a for loop, you have a variable called i, which is initialized to some value. Then there's some value which is checked. So i is compared to some value to identify the termination condition. And every time through the loop, the variable i is incremented. Here, the technical term for the variable i is to refer to it as the loop index. It is the loop, the variable which which is used to, for a for loop to specify how many times the loop should iterate and the value of i could also be used within the loop. For example, if this is a variable, uh, a loop which is doing something to an array, then it often happens that you index the array, in this case the array I'm calling x, using the loop index or some function of the loop index such as i plus 1. So if, the, if I'm inside a loop, at the beginning of the loop, the loop, the loop variable, the loop index is going to be accessed. And very frequently within the loop, it happens, often happens that the loop index is accessed again and again due to the fact that it is the loop index. So loop indices are a good example of variables which show, are likely to show good temporal locality of reference. And many of you write programs which use such loops. So these concepts, the, the idea that uh, functions or loop, lo uh, for loops have variables which are likely to be used a lot within that function or that loop suggests that programs which use these features will show reasonable temporal locality of reference. What about spatial locality of reference as far as data is concerned? In other words, if a particular address A is accessed, is being accessed now, the idea that it is quite likely that address A plus 1 or address A minus 1 will be referenced in the near future. Remember that these are the addresses of data items. So what kind of data objects might cause this property to be seen? Now, immediately the thought which may com be coming into your mind is about arrays. If you do have a, let's say a one-dimensional array, remember an, ar an array is uh, up, up on the top, I'm going to draw an example of an array. This might be the array x. So it has, each element of the array has an index. This might be an array of size 100, in which case the index of the last element will be 99, the index of the second last element would be 98 and so on. So let's suppose that at time t I was accessing the element x of 3. Now if I have, if the reason that I was setting up this array was to, let's say, step through a series of data, then it could well happen that after accessing one particular element, I will access the next element and so on. So this notion of stepping through an array is very clearly going to show very good spatial locality of reference. The same could be said about uh, things like structs or structures. If I do have a collection of of different kinds of data which are associated with each other and, and, and defined as a struct, declared as a struct, a C struct, then the ele elements of the struct are going to be stored in neighboring memory locations, which means that they're going to have addresses by which one could call them neighbors of each other. And if I access one field of the struct and then another field of the struct, 
and then another field of the struct, then all of these references, if they happen close to e each other in time, would enhance the spatial locality of reference of my program. So putting all this together, it looks like uh, there are certain principles which may fall out. As far as instructions are concerned, good practices might be all that we have to worry about for the moment. As far as data is concerned, we may have to be aware that in the indices and loop indices and local variables are special and that in stepping through an array, it might be good to try to step through the array, let's say sequentially, rather than stepping through the array in some random fashion. By random fashion, I mean first accessing the 98th element, then the 0th element, then the 6th element and so on. Because there would be a, a benefit from the perspective of spatial locality of reference as far as that sequential stepping through the or serial stepping through the array is concerned. And therefore, if that is under, in my control, I could enhance the spatial locality of reference of my program by doing the stepping through the array. So some ideas which come to mind about how it might impact the way that we write programs. But all of this discussion about locality of reference came about because we were trying to understand what considerations an operating system page fault handler might use in deciding which page to replace from memory in the event of a page fault. And recall that locality of reference was a principle about how the typical behavior of programs as far as memory accesses are concerned. So stepping back to the page replacement policy, um, we now have this question. For a program that displays good locality of reference, spatial and temporal, what would be a good page replacement policy? In other words, what would be a good uh, consideration for the operating system page fault handler to use in deciding which page to replace from memory? Now, let's try to understand the principle in a slightly different way. Now, let's look at this line, which is a timeline. So the timeline starts at some point in the past. It goes to, through to the indefinite future. And somewhere in the middle is now, which might be labeled as 0 or, 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 or just some time in some intermediate time. Now, what do we know from the principle of locality of reference? We know that, let's suppose that I know the memory uh, reference which is happening now. Let me more specifically say, let's suppose that at the time called now, a page fault has occurred due to the reference to a particular page, which I'll call P of X. I'm not going to talk about particular memory variables or addresses anymore because we know that from the perspective of page virtual memory, both the virtual and the physical address spaces are viewed as pages. And therefore, and, and the replacement of entities from memory is not going to happen on, in terms of bytes or words. It's going to happen in chunks of pages. So I will refer to the individual references as being page references. And the offset within the page is of secondary importance at the moment. So at now, what has happened is, or what is happening now, is that a page fault has occurred due to a reference to some variable which is on the page P sub X. That could be, P, P, could be page P3, whatever it is. Now, what do we know about the consequences from the principle of locality of reference about the fact that page P sub X has been referenced? We know that the next reference is likely to have, the next, if I look into the future, it's likely that I will see references to memory locations which are either on page P or the neighbors of page P. That's one way to look at uh, the principle of locality of reference. But that doesn't help us very much in making the page replacement decision. The page replacement decision is, the, the decision that has to be made is, among all the pages which are currently present in main memory, which one should I replace from main memory in order to make space for page P, P, P sub X? So the decision has to be made based not on the identity of page P sub X, but on the identity of the pages which are currently present in main memory. So let's assume that the, well, so this is the question. Which page should be replaced from memory to make space for page P sub X? Okay, now let me assume that uh, I can look back in time. I know that I can't look forward in time, but I do know that I can look back in time. Because in order to look back in time, I, re I, I really just have to remember, I mean, before time now, if I think about time now minus one, if I remembered what happened at time now minus one somewhere, then when time moves forward, I will be able to look back in time. So I can look back in time by just remembering what happened in the past when it happened. Okay, now let's suppose that I knew um, something about among all the pages which were in memory, which ones were actually accessed in the near future. I'm sorry, in the near past. I cannot look into the future, but I can apparently look into the past. Now let's suppose that currently the pages which are in main memory are the pages P1, P2, P3 through Pn. So there are n pages in main memory. And my objective is to identify one of them as the page to be evicted. 
Now, let's suppose that the page which was referenced just before now, in other words, the previous memory reference was to page P1. P1 is one of the pages which is currently in main memory. Now, by the principle of locality of reference, I know that if page P1 was referenced there at time now minus 1, then it is quite likely that it will be referenced again in the near future, which means that as far as now is concerned, page P1 is not a good candidate for replacement. Page P1 is one of the pages which is likely to be referenced sometime in the near future. It was, it was referenced at now minus 1 and is therefore likely to be referenced at now, now plus 1 or now plus 2 sometime in the near future. Similarly, if I know that page P2 was referenced just, or P5, I'm sorry, was referenced just before page P1 in the recent past, then I know that page P5 also is not a good candidate for replacement since it too is likely to be referenced sometime in the near future. This gives me the basis for identifying a page replacement policy. And the idea might be, I look back at the recent references and any page in main memory which was referenced recently is not a good candidate for replacement by the principle of locality of reference. It would not be good for me to replace P P page P1 or page P5 since they are likely to be referenced in the near future. So then the question arises, among all the pages which are currently present in main memory, I have eliminated page P1, I have eliminated page P5 as, ca good ca as candidates for eviction. So which of these pages would be the best one to evict? And the answer as you can quickly see is, I want to evict that page from main memory that was referenced la least recently. In other words, I continue this looking back in time and I eliminate page P1 because it was referenced at now minus 1. I eliminate page P5 because it was referenced at time now minus 2. Similarly, I eliminate other pages by looking back in time. And I'm left with one page. That is the page which was referenced least recently. And that would in fact be the page which is best to replace. So let's suppose that the page which was referenced least recently was page 3. The previous reference to page P3 was sometime in the distant past, which means that it's very unlikely that page P3 is going to be referenced any time in the near future. Among all the pages which are present in main memory, P3 is the one which is least likely to be referenced in the near future based on the principle of locality of reference. So if my programs show good locality of reference, then it would make a lot of sense to use this red statement at the bottom as the basis for defining a page replacement policy. In other words, pick from all the pages in memory that page that was referenced least recently. What would you call a page replacement policy that uses this idea? You would call it the least recently used page replacement policy. And this is a, a commonly used term in computer circles and is frequently abbreviated as LRU. So the least recently used page replacement policy is builds heavily on the model defined by the principle of locality of reference as we now understand it. Now the question which arises now is, we, we do need to satisfy ourselves that the operating system page fault handler can actually use the least recently used policy. In other words, that it is a feasible policy. We've seen that it makes a lot of sense from the perspective of the principle of locality of reference, but if it is not feasible to implement it, then we need not uh, take it into consideration. Operating systems won't use it. So how do we, uh, how do we argue about this? So you, you saw that what we were doing in our timeline was we were looking back in time and seeing when a page was used last. We looked back at now minus 1 and saw that page P1 was used. We looked back at time now minus 2 and saw that page P5 was used and so on. So essentially to implement the least recently used policy, the operating system page fault handler would have to keep track of when each page was, used, was, was last used. For example, for P1, it would remember that page P1 was last used at time now minus 1. For page P5, it would remember that P5 was referenced la most recently at time now minus 2 and so on. So this is the kind of information that the page fault handler would have to keep track of in order to know which page among the P1 through Pn was least recently used. And it could do this by associating a timestamp, in other words, the time at which that page was most recently accessed along with the page table entry corresponding to that page. Then when the time comes to make a page replacement decision, it could look at the, the it, it could look among all the timestamps in the page table to find the page which has the smallest timestamp. What does it mean to have the smallest timestamp? By timestamp I mean some indication of time at which the reference was made. So if pay, if now is uh, six o'clock, then now minus one is six o'clock minus a few nanoseconds and so on. These are times. 
So to identify the least recently used page, we look for the page which has the smallest timestamp and that will be the page which was referenced farthest ago in the past. That is why the timestamp is the smallest. These timestamps are monotonically increasing. Now the question arises, um, is it feasible to actually do both of these things? In other words, to among all the page table entries to find the one which is the smallest and also you will notice that we are also talking about updating the page table entries in order to keep track of the timestamp. In other words, whenever page P1 is accessed, its page table entry will have to be accessed to update the timestamp. Otherwise, it will have a timestamp from the previous reference. Therefore, there is a fair amount of work involved in, 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 in updating the timestamps because for every memory reference, the page table entry will have to be updated. The timestamp entry will have to be updated for page P1. And then potentially a huge number of comparisons to identify the timestamp which is smallest when a page replacement decision has to be made. Now, is this uh, a big consideration? The fact that in order to find the smallest timestamp, you'll have to compare a lot of timestamps. How do you find the smallest among 100 numbers? You have to compare them in some fashion and ultimately find out which of them in these comparisons ends up as the consensus uh, minimum value. How many comparisons might, might we be talking about here? If you have only four pages, this might not be a large number of comparisons. But if I have a main memory which is gigabytes in size, then the number of pages in the main memory could be substantial. It could be millions. And if I have to find the smallest among, um, if I have to find the smallest among millions of timestamps, that could take a fair amount of time. Right? So the, this, the large number of comparisons required to identify the least recently used page, which will be identified by the page which has the smallest timestamp of recent reference in its page table entry might mean that this becomes an infeasible policy unless I could think of some other way to keep track of the least recently used page. Now instead of keeping track of the least recently used page using a timestamp, what if I kept track of the least recently used page, in fact of the order in which pages were referenced using a stack, in other words a stack of recently used pages. And how might this work? You, you all know what a stack is, the stack, the stack of books on a table. So when a new book comes, you put it on the top of the stack. Why do I talk about a stack? Because if I have a stack of references, every time a page is referenced, I put it on top of the stack. If it was somewhere in the middle, because it's the re reference from the recent past was not, 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 not too re recent, then I take it out from the middle of the stack and put it onto the top of the stack. Therefore, if I look at the stack at any given point in time, the top of stack will be the most recently referenced page, the second on the stack will be the second most rec recently referenced page, and so on. And the page at the bottom of the stack would be the least recently referenced page. In other words, candidate for replacement. So here we're talking about the idea of maintaining a separate stack. This has nothing to do with our function call and return stack. This would be maintained by the page fault handler. This is just a stack of page numbers. So if page 3 was least recently used, it will be on the bottom of the stack. Page 1 was most recently used, it's on top of the stack. In our example, page 5 was the second most recently used page, it's on second position of the stack. So what will have to be done every time a page is referenced? I'll have to make sure that this stack, this LRU stack as it might be called, is kept correct. It should always contain the information of the order in which, if you think about it, this particular stack is keeping track of the order in which the recent references happened to these pages. So let's suppose that right now the page P sub X is being referenced and it uh, is not causing a page fault, but it actually happens to be page P7, which is down here in the stack. As I mentioned, to update the LRU stack, I'll have to take P7 out from here and put the number 7 on top of the stack. Therefore, to keep track of the stack of least recently used pages, um, every time a page is referenced, it will potentially have to be searched for in the stack, removed from its current location, and put onto the top of the stack, which once again, if there are millions of pages in memory, might end up being extremely expensive because this will have to be done on every memory access, not on every page fault. The updating of the timestamp would have to happen on every memory reference, not on every page fault. These could be very frequent events. So neither of these seems to be a satisfactory policy for large main memories. They might be acceptable policies for very small main memories, but we know that main memories today are large and therefore we might actually come up with the conclusion, okay, so the LRU page would be the one at the bottom of the stack in this description and there is a problem that the stack must be updated on every memory access. So the conclusion that we may come up with, I mean we have looked at two what seem to be very reasonable ways to implement the LRU policy and we have also argued that neither of them is really a good idea in terms of 
implementation because they will slow down the page fault handler substantially because for millions of pages it will take a long time to do the comparisons and it will take a long time to keep updating the stack compared to the processor time which is nanosecond. We do not want to slow things down too much. And the bottom line uh, conclusion might be LRU might be too expensive in practice. We might not find operating systems actually using LRU as a page replacement policy. This is unfortunate. Why? Because we had come up with, we learned about the principle of locality of reference. We understood that it is, it seems to make sense for the kinds of programs that we write. We came up with a page replacement policy based on that model of program behavior, but we find out that it might not be feasible. It might be too expensive to implement in practice. This looks like a dead end, but uh, we'll uh, move forward to understand that it is conceivable that operating systems can use the principle of locality of reference and use LRU like ideas without having to have the full overheads of implementing LRU. So there could be alternatives to the LRU as a page replacement policy. So if there are going, if there could be efficient mechanisms for building page replacement policies that are LRU like in that they allow the principle of locality of reference to be used as a consideration in page replacement decisions and prevent that worst case scenario from actually happening, then that would satisfy our requirements. And we will continue from this point in lecture 15. Thank you.